my colleague Sidudia and myself were responsible for annual or statistics at the IEA. And we are going to, to, to make a short presentation about the main trends in oil, um, in oil at, the, at the world level, about the main concepts we are using dealing with statistics and about the main technical details that you could uh, face collecting annual oil statistics. So here's a short overview at the, of the um, three, uh, three topics we are going to cover today. So uh, what I'm presenting, Sedu uh, is uh, here too. So if you have some questions, you can ask them in the, in the chat. And of course, after the presentation, there are also some uh, 15 minutes, uh, which you can use to ask questions about some points that you, want, you would like to, to deepen knowledge about. So first, uh, a few points about um, the main trends in the oil market. So as you see, the latest data we have is from 2021. Because uh, as you probably know, we published uh, we published the new data for 22 in um, in July. Even if uh, other departments of the IA, of course, do predictions, they also have some data, already some data available. So the main thing we can see when we compare uh, the situation 50 years ago and now is that the share of oil has disappeared. Um, so in total, the, the 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 size of the world energy supply has been multiplied by something like 2.5. Uh, but oil was representing almost half of the supply uh, for 50 years ago, and now it's just it's less than one third of the supply. So while the total was multiplied by 2.5, it's less than 1.5 for oil. So still growing, but at a much slower pace than uh, than the rest of uh, energy sources. And another thing, when you look at the table of, on the on the left, is that there was a there are major, major changes over the last few years in the main uh, producing countries of oil, because as you as you see now, uh, two years ago, it was the United States, which became the, the world first uh, producer of oil, thanks to unconventional resources, which is quite a big, big change compared to more than 10 years ago. Uh, so first, looking at refinery capacities. So as you see on in the long term, it has always been uh, growing over the last uh, the last decades. There was, a, of course, a smaller, um, Small decrease in uh, intake and output during the the COVID year, but it's in the, it's still now back on the, on the growing trend for twenty one, and you will see in a few months for for twenty two. Um, so this is for supply and the, on the the demand side, as you can see, the demand has also uh, grown a lot. Uh, it is mostly uh, the growth has mostly relied on uh, on uh, on Asia. And regarding sectors, of course, main uh, the main demand sector for oil, as you as you know, is a uh, road uh, the road sector. So these are very, are very uh, basic facts we can uh, we can talk about for the oil market. Now I'll dig a bit a bit much uh, deeper in the main concept we are dealing with uh, when talking about uh, oil. The first concept you will probably have to know is the difference between primary and secondary products. So here you see on the on the left of the screen the the main uh, primary product. Of course, the main primary product for oil is uh, crude oil, the oil that is directly extracted from uh, from the earth. And we also have condensate, which are kind of um, gases, and uh, also liquids, which are assimilated with oil. And we also have secondary products, uh, which are assimilated as primary product because they go back to the refineries uh, that we call uh, here feedstocks, which are secondary products, which are um, inputted to refine refin again. Um, and uh, here, so I'll, I'm letting you appear on the, the right side, all the secondary products that you can have uh, uh, as a result of uh, refining processes. So a lot of different products, uh, which are defined by very specific um, specifications. So the main one, of course, you know, of the, you know at least the names, gasoline, diesel, kerosene, and also a few, um, I'd say, non-energy products. You can see on the on the right, on the on the right, sorry, like uh, white spirits, lubricants, or bitumen, which are not used for energy, but we have to take into account because uh, the energy that is represented by crude oil is still transformed into these uh, secondary products. that in the, one more detail maybe about condensates so we distinguish two types of condensates the field condensate which are recovered from uh, 
from gas fields and the plant condensate, which come, of course, as the name indicates, uh, from um, from uh, separation facilities. So that's it for the main uh, the two main concepts. Then, in terms of uh, physics, there are a few concepts which are very essential in understanding uh, oil. The first one, of course, is uh, density. So as, as you probably know, uh, most of uh, most of the oil uh, products are uh, lighter than water, but not all of them. So here you can see a scale of um, on a unit which is called AP, APA, American Petroleum Institute, which is scale used to measure um, oil density. So 10 corresponds to, to, to water. And then at the APA index increases, density decreases, the oil, uh, the oil products are lighter. And you see there are a few products, as I said, like oil sands, which are um, which have a higher density than, than water. The second physic physical parameter, which is uh, very interesting also, to, uh, which is a subject of interest, is the sulfur content. And uh, of course, for, for sanitary reasons, and uh, so for energy efficiency reasons, uh, most of the sulfur um, content of the crude oil has to be removed to meet a spe different specifications depending on the, on the product. And the third, the third uh, physical parameter we which of course interests a lot, is the energy content, which is the calorific value, <laughs> which is which is the, what allows us to convert between mass and uh, energy. So for example, when we are doing energy balances, it is essential to know calorific values. So for, uh, for oil, it's mostly around uh, 40,000 kilojoule per kilogram, but of course it depends from product to product and also from uh, flow to flow or from country to country. It can vary a bit. And for some products, also it's a, it's a fixed by uh, specifications. Um, so, a few words about um, oil classification. So, as you can see on those two uh, two diagrams, depending on what on what kind of oil you have in uh, in output, you can have very uh, different result. Very different result in terms of uh, product you have uh, at the exit of the refinery, but. One thing you can say is that, com contrary to the fact that every year we are collecting data on the market, refining is uh, very stable because, of course, you cannot um, you cannot uh, reconfigure your refinery every year. So as you see for this example of a refinery, of, uh, refining in a country, it's very stable here, except for you see the year 20, um, 2011, because uh, probably a, a refinery unit was uh, was stopped during uh, for maintenance during this year, which is something which... Uh, happens very very often so now that we uh, have talked about the main concept uh, regarding the the oil itself let's see about the first stage of the supply so the supply of the of primary products so of course the first step is the production so when you 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 think at the country level of course the the first step is the production of uh, crude oil if the country produces oil so here we have a few more more details you see uh, about the, so the, about the production which come from uh, wells and as you see as I mentioned at the beginning so natural gas liquid condensates are included in our um, oil statistics but other associated cases will not be covered by um, the oil um, data but by the gas data you uh, about which we just have the presentation uh, before then. The second uh, line of supply is the what we call the other sources. So it can be additives, it can be biofuels, but things which do not come directly from um, from the ground, from oil production. Then, of course, the supply is influenced by trade, so imports and exports, um, by changes in stocks. Of course, if you take uh, uh, oil from stocks, it goes to the it can go to the to the refinery. And of course, uh, another thing which is very important that we talk already about is the backflows, which means secondary products which have been refined and which come back to the refinery. And there is some um, some oil which is um, directly used, which is not refined. For example, oil that you crude oil that you burn from uh, for uh, to produce uh, electricity. Um, there can be also what we call product transfers that, uh, for example, a product which uh, changes specification and that we reclassify as primary product, which can uh, which can happen, for example, for, for feedstocks. So 
that's what we can say for the first part of the supply, which is the, the refinery, the, the, refin the input refineries. And then we have the second part of the supply process, which is after the refineries, how do we supply uh, primary products? So of course we have uh, outputs. Then some of this output can go directly to the refineries. For example, refining gases as a fuel for the refining processes themselves. Then there can be, as I mentioned before, transfers of secondary products from one category to the other because the product can change specification. There can be, for example, some evaporation, some, some chemical transformation, which make a uh, product change uh, categories. Uh, <clears throat> but of course, not all transfers are possible. So for example, as you see, um, kerosene can become um, gasoil, gas, gasoil or kerosene can become LPG. But on the other side, it's very unlikely that LPG becomes a uh, fuel oil, for example. So not all transfers are physically possible. Of course, you have to wonder whether um, a product can become naturally, for example, degrading itself, another kind of, um, of product. So as I mentioned, there are transfers, then there are primary product receipts. So it can be, as I mentioned before, the bio, bio products like uh, biogasoline, ethanol, or biodiesel, which uh, are blended after the refining processes and not before. Um, there can be also recycling, the product coming back to the to the to supply, but after the not being refined again. And another point, which is more a, a point in terms of um, counting, is that the marine bunkers, uh, so the the oil that is um, that goes uh, into international shipping. Is not counted in a in a country supply, but it's it exits the the supply chain before uh, before entering the supply itself. And of course, you also have as before uh, trade and uh, stock changes. So that's what we can say for the for the supply side. Then, as we as as we said um, we said before, so. We can analyze in, in physical terms the, the refining processes, and it depends actually on the units, because if we are reasoning in terms of uh, mass or uh, energy, we lose a bit with the processes, because of course, the efficiency of a process is not be above 100%, so you lose a bit of mass of, or energy. But in terms of uh, volume, the quantity you have in output is often higher, because when you refine, you often do a lighter product. So in terms of volume, you can uh, have bigger quantities after refining than before refining. So it really depends on what on what unit you are using. And just to, I mean, it's a very, 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 uh, very few words about, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, international shipping. Of course, I mean, we know we're not included in the, the, the supply at the country level, but still it's very important because as you know, um, international shipping, so shipping to another country is a very important part of the world demand for, for oil. But once again, it doesn't enter the uh, country supply as we define uh, according to international standards. Um, so that's it for the for the supply side. And you see, I mean, just a few examples of um, what happens on the demand side. So for consumption, so uh, as, as you know, there are many different types of uh, used for oil products, so for electricity, for, as I mentioned before, crude oil that can be directly burned to produce electricity, kerosene for aviation, diesel and, and gasoline for road transport, and many other kinds of um, non-energy use, for example, white spirit, lubricants, and, and so on. So that's it about the um, main concept of um, oil, oil products and refining processes. Then in the last part of the presentation, I will focus on the uh, four specific points that you should be very careful about when you report uh, oil data. So first, just a very quick overview of, of how our um, our questionnaires are organized. And we, of course, we, you will see them in a few minutes uh, in the exercise session with uh, Sedou and I. So there are seven uh, main tables. So the first one is the supply of primary products. So before the refining uh, processes, the second one, this table 2A, is uh, the supply of uh, secondary products, so basically the refining outputs. And before the before detailing the, the demand, we have a second table, which is 
basically for a petrochemical delivery. So you, you should think you could think it's a part of the of the the demand side. But since there, as I mentioned before, backflows, we we count them there. So if there are backflows, they can go back from table two B to table one. Then table three, of course, it the it the demand. So you 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 count for all the consumption sectors, the energy on 3A and the non-energy on 3B um, uses of uh, oil and oil products. Table four and five are the table for uh, imports and exports. And table six is that it's, um, actually it's a, a new table that, um, and it's not a new table, but we are now trying to, to, to make a very standardized database about, uh, out of that. Is is the, the table on refining capacities, and now I mean since um, this year we are not we have launched um, a refining uh, database. So of course, if you could fill this um, this information on refining capacities, it could be also very very useful for us and for all the people that use um, that use data from their year. So that's it for the general presentation of uh, of our questionnaires. That once again you will see very soon in the in the exercise session. And now, as I said, there are four points on which I would like to very stress and uh, um, ask for um, attention because they're maybe a bit trickier than just um, counting production or refinery output or consumption. The first one is the relationships between the tables. So it's quite logical, for example, that um, the trade that you count uh, in the table four and five is equal to the trade that you are counting at the the supply tables from primary products and secondary products. But there are also relationships with the other questionnaires. So with the other presentations that my colleagues have done or are going to do um, the next few days. So relationships with the electricity questionnaire, of course, every time you use um, you use oil or oil products to produce electricity, it has been to it has to be counted the same way in both questionnaires. And also, which is quite important, is for the um, Renewables uh, questionnaires. Uh, we count the um, the primary product receipts of uh, bio gasoline, ethanol, uh, biodiesel, and uh, bio kerosene the same way in the renewable and in the um, um, oil questionnaires. But I will talk a bit about more about that. Then another um, another point which is very um, which is very uh, important to be uh, to be careful about is uh, what we do with the condensate with the liquefied hydrocarbons. Actually, there are two different ways to deal with them. So, if it's a rather heavier, heavier kinds of um, liquid hydrocarbons, so more than uh, five carbons, more than pentans, uh, usually they are used in uh, refineries. So they are reported as supply of natural gas liquids in our um, in our uh, oil questionnaires, and also of course as output. And the second uh, second way to report natural gas liquids is that they are used directly for so for more lighter products below below five carbon uh, atoms. Uh, and then you see natural gas liquids that are directly used, and uh, they can be also directly used or transferred to another product. Which is LPG in the in the secondary products. So you see here on the on the right of uh, of the screen that uh, here this uh, NGL so 50, um, 50, 50 kilotons of product receipts is uh, is transferred to um, to um, to LPG LPG which is a secondary product. So there's no refining process. There's just a transfer between natural gas liquid which is a primary product. And the uh, liquefied petroleum gases, which is a secondary product. So that's it for this um, this point. Another very important point I mentioned before is um, the blending of uh, the biofuels used for blending, which are reported in the renewables questionnaire. So for this, as you see on the left, is the renewable questionnaires. We have to to um, to report these quantities in the secondary products, so in the sheets dedicated to biogasoline, biodiesel, and so on. And you also have to report this total as receipts from other sources in the additives um, additives sheet, as you see in the middle of the of, of the screen. So very important once again to have a consistency between the, the two questionnaires. 
And uh, one last thing. Once again, I mentioned it again, but it's also good to see it directly in the questionnaires. It's the backflows. So projects which have been refined and which are sent back once again as an input to the refineries. So you see all the arrows on the on the on the left, and um, it has been it has to be reported both as I said before in tables two B and in table one. As uh, as backflows, and also it can be reported in table three as consumption, <coughs> either energy or non-energy, in the petrochemical sector. You just see the small dot, which is uh, some quantity going back to the the refinery. And uh, yeah, maybe one subtlety is that it goes it can goes back as backflow. I mean, from the industry. Is there in the refinery or not going to the refinery, which is just uh, a transfer? And uh, well, maybe I won't be too too confusing because uh, when you're talking about energy balances, of course, we also consider non-energy use because we want to have total and um, total supply equal total demand, which of course is the same of demand in the energy sectors and in the non-energy sectors. But here, I mean, we are looking on the I would say on the on the right of this um, of this of this graph. And we are just taking into account the energy demand. So that's it for the the, main, the four main points, as I said, that that would like to to insist on. So I mean, just a few few words. I said what the resources which are avail available in our uh, uh, at the IEA. So there, on the in the middle, you see a lot of uh, free products, uh, especially on the monthly data, but. Of course, a few highlights on the annual data are available, but most of the um, most of the most precise information, I'd say, is um, is uh, open to to purchase. And uh, a few other references if you need the the basics. So of course, in the manual um, and the the guidelines made by the IEA, and also another guidelines which are the IRS from the United Nations, the international recommendation of on the energy statistics. Which are the, the basis for most of the definitions we use in uh, when we process oil data. So thank you very much.